Okay, so here's a quick video showing what's new in version 0.5. So the new stuff in this version is some bug fixes and some other bits, but the main new things in this version are generic grid-based um, corpus browsing, um, support for the array touch, which is a subset of that, and then finally some Max for Live um, devices. So you'll be able to use a lot of these things directly in Max. So um, I'll just go ahead and show you uh, the things in context. So for this version, I imagine there's some people that uh, might not have used SB tools before if you're just going to use it in live. So I'll just show you how to quickly set this up. Um, by the time you view this video, you'll see a releases here because I'll, I'll have done the update. But for now, as I have not yet done it, um, that's not there. So what you can do is you can come to the URL, which is the SP tools, and you click on code and click download zip. Um, I'll cancel that because I've already done that. Um, and in your download folder, you'll get this SP tools uh, master so you just unzip that and then you go to your packages folder which on uh mac i don't know where it is on windows exactly but it's under um, your user then documents then max 8 then packages and then you that's where it's going to go so um what you can do is rename it to sp tools this doesn't really matter but it just looks tidier and you just drag it over and there you go so that will set it up um, you don't need to do this in order to use the Max for Live devices because they're all self-contained. But um, if you are going to use some of the examples from the Max for Live, uh, sorry, from the normal install from Max, like the corpuses, or the corpora rather, um, you'll need to do this step for them to show up in Max's path. So even if you're just using it um, in live, this is beneficial to do. Okay, first up we have grid match. So grid match is, is basically like corpus match, but it's... Um, well, gridified, I'll sort of load one of the, the, the voice corpus here. So this, you can load the same corpora that you can use with corpus match. Um, and what it does, instead of giving you that kind of pretty pattern that the other ones do, you can see it lines everything up in a grid. So this is quite useful if you wanna navigate the samples and have, um, well, for one, if you wanna use kind of your mouse to be able to just sort of squirrel around, <coughs> you know, the samples this way. Um, but it's also useful if you're taking in controller data. So um, here I'm just using this, this thing here, but this could be like the input from, uh, you know, to a gamepad, uh, two knobs on a fader, on a fader box or whatever, whatever it is that sends um, an X and Y position. So I have like this sort of fake controller data here. Um, and what this will do is it'll find the nearest match based on that grid. And this grid takes the whatever dimensionality reduction is applied when you make the corpus and it just spreads it out to make the most effective use of that space. Each time you load it, it's slightly different because it's an algorithm and it runs. Um, so it'll sort of put the things in a slightly different space. So it's not deterministic in that way, but it will make the most effective use of that space. So um, that's the first thing here. And then this also has a bunch of the functionality that you have in Corpus Match. So the round robin stuff. So if I load the China one here, um, with round robin turned off, it'll literally play the same sample over and over, which might be desirable depending on what you want. Um, but if you turn it on, it'll it'll find the nearest ones. So here, there, you can hear it's a bit of a jump. So it's not always, um, you know, super super um, similar, but it's the nearest one in the gridification. Um, similarly, you can also use the different time scales. A bunch of this stuff is literally um, what you can do with Corpus Match. So it, it mirrors that um, pretty closely. So I can load the um, China Corpus here. And by default, it's sorted by the medium time scale. But if you want, you can have it sorted by the short or the, the full one. It just determines on this is uh, how much of the sample it's looking at when it's creating the grid interface. This will just give you a, a different flavor of interface. Um, that's all it's really going to do. Same thing, you can filter, so I can load the Corpus China, it can be only the, um, the quiet ones, only the bright ones or whatever, and you can see it still retains the grid um, orientation. So all that stuff is the same, and you can still navigate the samples. And then there's also support for the Airy Touch. So there's a separate um, object for this, which I'll, I'll show in a moment, but I can load a Corpus, and this will show me the kind of pixel interface that you have with the Airy Touch. <laughs> And I can use this as like a, if you want to use this with a mouse, you can use grid match with this interface because it looks kind of cool. You can browse the samples. And what you see here with the color, the color is another dimension. So when I do the dimensional dimensionality reduction to put it on the array touch, I'm reducing it to three dimensions. So two for the XY, and then the third dimension is getting mapped to color. 
So um, things are made in a, it's not a 3D grid, but it's a 2D grid. And then color is also indicating something about timbre. So the, like the yellow things will be kind of similar to each other. These sort of uh, kind of turquoisey colors will be similar to each other. So it's just another dimension, but um, this is just another other face that will let you browse around with that. Okay, so here we have the Airy Touch object. So it works in conjunction with um, Grid Match, but you can also use it as a generic um, position thing. So I'll load a, a corpus here, and you can see that um, I've got what's on the screen here, but that's also what's on the touch. So it's literally like a one-to-one -one to pixel thing. So I can browse around the sample just by clicking my mouse here. You can see I also get the X, Y, Z. If I'm doing it with a mouse, the Z will always be one, whereas if I'm doing it with the sticks, you know, the, the velocity with which I'm striking the drum will be the, not the drum, but the touch will be the Z. Um, so with this, you can browse it as you know, a 2, 2D interface or use this here. So um, there's a couple different controls for this. So one of the main ones is color stuff. So I'll load a corpus here. So by default, it uses this linear color map. Um, and it has this sort of bluish yellowish thing. The linear color map, there's a web page here if you want to look this kind of stuff up, but it makes it so the colors um, more uh, clearly identify the difference in the space in which they're occupying. It's kind of a weird thing, but like if you do just do like a rainbow thing, our perception of that is not linear. So linear is done. So like the difference between blue and turquoise is um, equal to the turquoise and whatever. It's just a, a way to view it. So um, that's what these are, but you can also change them. So for example, linear is the one that's most accurate. So this will be the most representative of what the space is kind of like. Um, HSL is probably the most contrasty one. So if you want this sort of bombastic looking kind of interface, that's the one to go for. Um, there's also rainbow, um, cyclic, grayscale, if you want that kind of midnight vibe and colorblind and each one also has like a an optional offset so this is the hsl but i can offset it so let's say like i'll put 0 0.5 and it's still hsl but it's just starting in a slightly different place all right and finally um you can break the touch surface into uh, multiple zones so here i'm going to set it to four zones and then i'm going to load four corpora so i'll put the china one you can see it goes to top left voice go to top right um, the speak and spell or speak and math rather and then the plum butter one and the resolution so you can see the speak and math one here um, it's like 20 30 whatever little buttons um, that's just how many samples there are so it'll always get quantized to the amount of pixels there are available on the touch um, the actual performance space itself will be much more resolute but um, what it does for the interface so you can see on the touch I have the top quadrant is then <laughs> Um, so, and again, you can browse it with your mouse. And again, the, the pixels are just matching the resolution there, but there is, um, from here to here, there's a super tight resolution of what's going on with each one. Um, so that's the support for the Airy Touch. Okay, here I am in live, and I've got a demo project here that's gonna go through each of the devices and explain how they are, what they do and how they work, etc. So first on the left here, you can see I have places and I have SP tools. So if you do want to add that, you can click add folder. Um, and then you'll find, so if you go to your packages or wherever you've put SP tools, the folder that's M4L, just click that, hit open. And I just renamed it. So it says SP tools. So I've got all five of the devices here for now. So I've made five tracks just to be able to demo each of the bits. So this first one here is speed. So I explained some of this in the version 0.2 video, but I'll, I'll kind of do a bit of a recap. So what speed does, I'll just kind of have that playing there while we can see some of the things moving. So speed takes the onset detection that you get from SP tools, which you can adjust the sensitivity here. So I can, you know, tweak these things and, you know, make it so it, it happens less with the, the lockout and the threshold and sensitivity. But it takes that onset and it extracts meta parameters from that. And by that, I mean uh, parameters derived from the attack itself. So, um, this first one here, speed, is similar to the sensory percussion speed controller. So if you've used that before. But essentially, the faster you play, the, the higher this number will go, and then slowly it starts decreasing over time. So it's kind of like a busyness meter. The next one is tempo. So tempo is similar, but it doesn't uh, decrease over time. And it's also a little bit more like a, a tap tempo algorithm underneath the hood. So if you're playing faster, the number will be higher um, consistently. Uh, Excuse me, slope 
is the trajectory of the time between attacks. So if you're speeding up, so like bup, 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 uh, slope will start increasing. And inversely, if you're slowing down, slope will go down. So slope is kind of very useful for telling you whether you're speeding up or slowing down. Variance is how different the time between attacks is. So this specific example is quite varied. So the variance is sort of medium to high. If you were to play very just a consistent pulse nonstop, um, the variance would be zero or very close to zero. So the variance is how all over the place it is. And finally, direction, you can see is essentially like binary. It's either up or down. Um, it's whether the next hit is faster than the previous one or slower than the previous one. So it's kind of a, a cool little binary flip-flop. So that's what these are. So um, if you've used any kind of Max for Live device that allows you map stuff before, you'll be familiar with this interface. But if you haven't, um, this is a very useful thing in that you can just map anything to anything using Live's built-in mapping thing. So if I stop this for a moment, so if I click this map button here, you can see this starts flashing and I can kind of hover over anything, but I can click to map to delay time. So if I turn this delay on, you can see that the speed is now controlling the delay time of the left channel here. So I can just go ahead and just click and map a bunch more parameters here. <coughs> and you can see that all of these things are now controlling, you know, all of the parameters and the effects. If I click on the word, I can uh, disable that individual mapping, um, but while still leaving it mapped, it just sort of turns that one off and off. I can turn that back on. Um, I can also remove the mapping altogether. So now that's removed that mapping. So let me remove the, the dry wet and just put it back to 50% here and I'll map this one again. And this min, max, and curve, again, if you've used one of these devices that have this, you'll be familiar, but it sets the range for which it'll control this parameter. So let's say I want to just have the delay time be kind of on the long side. I'll set this here and you can see it's just jumping around the top end of that. Or if I want to just have, you know, very short delay times, it'll put it there. And then the curve is whether it's doing kind of a logarithmic or uh, inverse log curve on the incoming stuff. So um, this is how the general mapping will work in a few of these devices, um, but it's quite powerful in that you can leverage the SP tools, uh, descriptors, type, and controllers type things, but use it to control um, a whole bunch of stuff. And using Live's built-in thing, you can map stuff, you can do automation, you can do you know everything that you would normally do. So that's speed. So controllers is similar, um, except there's a lot more bits. So <coughs> again, I'll just kind of recap um, some of the stuff that, that I've explained in the other thing. But um, what controllers does, it takes loudness and centroid, which is effectively brightness uh, perceptually, and it derives metaparameters from that. So here on the left, we have the same thing as the other one. So on this onset detection algorithm. So if I click that, you can see the things going and sets the sensitivity and um, the lockout and all that kind of stuff. But you see that we've got a lot of numbers moving here. So from loudness, the first one is a normalized loudness. So it just sets it from zero to one or zero to hundred in this case. The mean is the average over time. So by default, it's seven um, onsets. The slope is, well, the slope variance and direction are the same as we had in um, the speed device, but now applied to loudness. And then we have those same exact things, but for centroid. So the things that are different here are the normalized ones. So this is like zero to one or zero to hundred. And then the mean is the average over time. So if I play this here, um, so here I'm using the pitch loop 89 thing and I'll just kind of map a bunch of stuff here. So you can get some really interesting kind of things because you have a ton of things that you can map. Same for this one here. A couple slightly different things there, but high or whatever. So you can see all of this is going kind of crazy here. We have this sort of super map, uh, super intricate delay coming from the uh, controller data. So just the loudness and the centroid being mapped across to a bunch of different things. And as before, you can disable them on and off. Stop that so it shuts up and then, you know, unmap them here. So uh, that's similar. So speed and controllers, <coughs> excuse me, speed and controllers are very similar in that sense. Next we have descriptors. 
So descriptors is um, almost kind of like the raw information that feeds those, but we do have real-time and, and onset-based versions of that. So if I hit play here, you'll see we have um, two columns. Well, they're the same descriptor, so we have loudness, centroid, flatness, and pitch. So these are the, the basic descriptors that are in um, most of SP tools. Um, on the right here, you see the onset-based ones. So these happen um, every attack. So when you see when there's an attack, you see the numbers move. If I put this lockout to be very high, you can see these numbers will move much more slowly. Um, and if I put the lockout to like nothing, it's super jittery and it'll kind of jump all over the place. But on the left here, you can see, um, it's, a, it's almost like an envelope follower for, for each of those parameters. So as before, I can, you know, I've got an Anson here and I can just map them. Um, one of the big differences here is, is that we have these onset based ones, so the ones that sort of move every attack. Um, but in addition, we have these continuous ones here on the left. Um, so these are essentially envelope follower versions. So with this, we have a couple different parameters. So we have an input min max, output min max, and we have a slew. So um, I'll explain. <coughs> Excuse me. Getting over cold. Um, actually, I'll just bypass this real quick. So I'll explain this here. So you can see that the, um, the reason we need these extra parameters here is because um, descriptors can come in in like a wide range. So your dB, your loudness can be like from negative infinity to you know positive 20 or whatever like that. It's a really, really wide range that can come in. So if I just hit play here, um, you can see that the, the loudness of this clip tends is kind of on the lower side. So um, if I use the min and max here, you can see that like this was not, not really going very high. So what I can do is I can set the input min and max to make the most of that range. So if I kind of turn this down here, this will set, so like negative, um, let's see, that's good So yeah, negative 50 dB is now the maximum. And you can see this is now using the whole range. And then as before, I can set the min and max here to the mapping range. So the output one is basically what you want it to look like on the thing you're mapping. And the input one is kind of the useful range that you're getting coming in. And then the other numbers here are the slew. So um, if I set this to zero, it'll jump up very quickly, but then I can put this down very slow. And you see, I kind of get this, it'll go up very quickly, but it'll go down slowly. Or I can do the opposite. I can have it um, move up slowly, but come down quickly. And then anywhere in between. So you can kind of massage these numbers to kind of get um, a kind of response time that works well for you. By default, it's 15 milliseconds in both ways, but you can kind of get it here. So if you put them really slow, it'll kind of move, you know, kind of a bit slowly over time, um, as opposed to, sounds pretty tinny. Um Yeah, you can kind of adjust the contour and you can do the same for the other parameters here. So if I map this to base um, and I can set the min and max here, um, to kind of take the most of that range. Essentially, you want to massage these numbers so you see the this thing taking up as much space as it can. Um, and then you map it to what you want. One of the main differences between this and controllers is controllers does that normalization for you, and you can calibrate and reset that here. Whereas descriptors is just kind of the raw data, so you can kind of be a bit more specific if you want to control that. Um, and you also get the, the real-time streams, which you don't get from controllers. So these are the um, descriptor mapping ones. So these in and of themselves don't do anything. They're meant to be used um, to map onto other devices. Now, <coughs> the last two here are the corpus match and concat match. So these are a bit more like um, kind of an unaffected or whatever, but it does the corpus based sampler matching and the uh, concatenative, uh, the concat um, synth corpus matching respectively. So um, in order to use these, uh, you have to drag a corpus. So if I go to the MISC folder, so if, if this is the first time using SP tools, once you've installed the package, you have these um, corpora here. So I'm gonna take um, corpus, let's do corpus China, and I'm gonna drag it onto this little window here, and it's loaded that. So now when I hit play, you can hear it's playing back a sample. So it's doing audio analysis and it's finding the nearest match from the incoming audio. There's a blend here so I can only hear my incoming audio or only hear the sample. Um, but it's essentially corpus match 
um, from SP tools, but just implement it in here. And as before, you have the sensitivity, or all the onset-based stuff here, and then you have all the, you know, the, the normal sample playback things, whether you're playing the whole sample, whether you're doing starting a little later, um, putting an attack, setting a curve, all these kind of things. And then here we have the loudness and spectral compensation, um, which you can apply um, if you want as well. So it's essentially a corpus match um, and that whole thing, but now just in here. And you can load a different corpus and all of that should work nice and dandy for you. So um, that's corpus match. Um, at the moment, if you wanna create your own corpus, you, you still have to do that in, in Max. I might make something for, like that in the future, but that feels a little not live-ish to open up a device that you're then gonna kinda create a corpus. Uh, it, I don't know, I'll have a think about that. It, it'll be easy to do, it's just it doesn't seem to make too much sense but it depends on you know, if it's useful to people. And then finally, uh, concat match is very similar. So I've got to drag the corpus here. So it's a different kind of corpus file. So this one says concat. Um, if you make your own, you'll, you'll be able to know which is which. So I'll just drag this onto here. And that loads up. And I kind of see a waveform here and um, I'll just kind of play some audio here. It does this kind of um, stitchy, mosaic-y um, kind of synthesis sound. And you have different kind of uh, window settings. You can put the time random. I can uh, put the rate real slow. You know, set the panning amount and the blend and you know, the playback speed and all sorts of other stuff. Um, but it is stuff that, that does what you can do with Concat Match, but just implement it so you can now do it in live. So, um, that's the sort of the devices here. So the first three have to deal with a mapping. So using the descriptors and leveraging that to map whatever in live, including these corpus match and cockat match ones. And then the other two are the uh, corpus based stuff that you have in SP tools. So corpus match and cockat match. Um, for future ones, what I want to add, because one of the, the main things that's really nice in SP tools is being able to do the class training and zone training. So like, like I've hit the edge of the rim, I've hit the center of the drum, I've hit the crotale or whatever. Um, and then being able to do something with that. So um, because of how life is set up, you can't take audio in and spit MIDI out in one device. It's, it's just not meant that way. So for the next update, I'm gonna build that where essentially you'll have like an audio track that you'll put, um, let's say like a SP class match on, and then it'll, it'll send data and then you'll have a MIDI track, which then will receive that data. So I have to sort of figure out how to, how to best implement that without that being too confusing. Um, but you'll have to have two devices, one that sends and one that receives. Um, but yeah, there you go. So this is the live based stuff for now. Have a play. Um, let me know what you think. Um, I think these are going to be nice additions, particularly if you're not super handy with Max, you'll be able to still use a bunch of the stuff from SP tools, but in, in live and in your own workflows, particularly this descriptor stuff, it's going to be really, I think, handy for doing mad stuff in live. Um, but yeah, that's the live stuff for now. So yeah, that's what's new in 0 0.5. Um, in the next update, I'm gonna include some more Max for Live stuff, mainly the stuff where you'll be able to do the class match stuff. So like the sensor percussion style zones. So the zones that you can train, you'll be able to use that stuff in live. Because of how live is set up, you can't take audio in and send MIDI out. It's two types of devices. So it'll be a send and receive. So I just wanna find a way to make that um, not super clunky. And then th there'll still be some new features and some new um, sort of abstractions and stuff, but the, the actual core, um, set of abstractions is kind of getting there. I, I don't have too much more to add. Like there's some more stuff I need to add, like make sure it works with every single sample rate and some other kind of under the hood things. But in terms of functionality, it, it's almost there in terms of functionality. There'll be more refinements, uh, more Max for Live devices and all that. But um, yeah, that's where we are at the moment.